Hey, welcome everybody into this edition of True Philadelphian Sportscast, the grittiest take. We are joined today by Pirlo Wisdom. Follow him on his channel. And then Andrew Santangelo, my co-host. This is the first time we have Andrew here on video with us as our co-host. How you doing, Andrew? I'll start with you. I'm doing very well. Uh, just got back from a mini mini vacation, went to Arkansas this past weekend, and uh, first time on, on a river and got to go fishing and uh, paddle boating, so it was, it was fun. Yeah, it sounds fun. That does sound fun. And then, uh, Pirlo, how's your day going? Oh, doing great. I've been doing videos all day and enjoying myself. This is this is what I love to do, man. Thanks for having me. It's awesome that you, you guys allow me to be on your program. Yeah, we love to have you. We love to have you, man. And I can't wait to be back on yours and then do uh, stuff with Steel and continue to do all that stuff and continue growing and all that. But let's get into our first matchup as this is our next edition of predicting the upsets with our percentages and we get to compare in the end after the first round who predicted right if anybody or if all of us decided that we did not predict very well this year so uh but we'll see what happens in the end we're going to start with pittsburgh and montreal because that should be one that doesn't take too long to get through I'll let Pirlo start with this one. Where do you have the percentage chance that Montreal could actually beat the Penguins? I don't usually go low, this low too quick or too much, but uh, especially in a five-game series. But I have like 10%. Um, Max Domi might not be there. as uh, I think he likely will. And to tell you the honest truth, I, I don't think he should. If I'm management, I'm probably going to say, hey, buddy, just sit down. It's okay. We don't really need to win this series in behind closed doors. I would never say that in the open. But uh, Montreal's offense, just there's nothing here I can see that can combat, even against Crosby, let alone Melton. No. Then you Drew in would have to step up. Else yeah. Price would have to stand on his head. As he like five the five years ago price or something maybe it's still in him I don't know, but and then you take in their defense, like oh Alsner's not going to be there. Yeah, <laughs> like whatever. He only happens. played he only played a handful of games <laughs> this year, but for the postseason I guess that could help since no. in his first year he's a shot blocking defenseman. If he's healthy, he helps you in that department. But I don't think it would have been a savior thing by any imagination for them. I just thought it was funny that it was even news at all. If Alsner's not going to be there as news to your defense, you're in trouble. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's what I But uh, anyway, Andrew, are you around that percentage or did you go a little bit uh, higher or lower for Montreal? I'll go around that percentage. I'll say about, I'll give him a 15% chance just because Pang, I mean, Penguins are, are, are by far the better team with their experience and everything they have from these past uh, playoffs exp, uh, exp, uh, chances they had. Uh, the reason why we'll give the Canadians a little better chance is because I do still really like Price. I still think he could perform, especially at, at a playoff level. So if he can kind of get going for him right out of the gate, maybe he can spark something in that team and give them confidence. Uh, and then, I mean, obviously the Penguins this past year and even in previous years kind of deal with a lot of injuries and uh, Joe, before we got on here, you mentioned how there might be a lot more injuries. So I think Penguins, that would be one of their fears in this series if is in jumping back into the thick of things right away. How well how well can they stay healthy? So I won't That's give them much point. of a chance, but I will say I'll give them a fifteen percent chance. Gotcha. Yeah, that's still not a high chance. I went the lowest out of this group because I only gave the can- Canadians and especially if Domi m- makes a wise decision. I wouldn't play if I had diabetes, especially with the positive tests that have been recently um, put out in, within the organization that they had at least three. I would say that that's a 5% chance at most because the 5% chance is Carey Price turning into Jonathan Quick for one series from when, not for the whole time to the cup. There's no chance this team's getting to the cup, but for one series from how Quick played in the Kings run to the cup, we had like a 1-5 goals against. Other than that, they're not beating the Penguins. That's the only way they're beating the Penguins, and I don't see Carey Price doing that because it's not even Carey Price. Their defense isn't good enough for him to have the pot. He would have to be as good as he was years ago, also before he ever had that like one injury he had. So, mm-hmm. like, um, but 
now we can go into our next five versus 12 matchup, which is one of our fine friend Pirlo here's teams, oh. the Edmonton Oilers against the Chicago Blackhawks. So I'll let you start with that one. What's the percentage chance you give the Blackhawks, especially knowing, like we talked about before the video, Corey Crawford might or might not be ready? Oh, well, um, well, if it's no Crawford, I'd almost put it less than Montreal to win. <laughs> like, really, <laughs> I, I don't think, uh, yeah, uh, Subban is, I have no faith in that at all. Uh, and uh, I give Chicago, with, with Crawford, I give Chicago about 20 to 25% chance. And that mostly is to do with the fact that Taze, you just never know what that guy can do for a team to put him on his back and give a run, especially with the short spurt, like five games. But like a five-game spurt rather than a full seven-game series, you just never know. Crawford could find lightning in a bottle, and um, there are things that could happen there. I don't like Chicago's defense really at all. Um, but all that being said, with uh, Dreisaitl and McDavid, I don't see enough, especially with speed-wise up the middle for Chicago to compete there. I uh, I got to go Edmonton, and I'm going like maybe Chicago. Like I said, if Crawford's in, 15-20. If not, I five, like really very, very, very little chance. And then take into consideration that it's going to be in the building that Edmonton normally plays in. And I do think that has uh is a it does have a certain amount of advantage by five to ten percent maybe so. yeah I, I agree with that they're going to need guys to step up in Dylan Strom and obviously Kubalik's going to have to keep playing like he played for them and then Brandon Sod has playoff experience uh DeBrinket is going to have to step up but the biggest uh thing is you got Dave Tibbet who's coached so well since coming to the Oilers and made everyone get better and better since being there. And it's no rip on uh, Jeremy Carlton. It's just he's a new head coach. You, yeah. you're, he's, a, he's just got to the job. He's a guy that seems like he is pretty smart with his wits and stuff, but he's new. Uh, he doesn't have the experience. Tibbet's been here for a while. I think that immensely helps, especially in a, such an odd scenario as this. But I'll let Andrew go before I give you my percentage. Yeah, and I, obviously it plays a big part on what Crawford does, and obviously we don't really know on what's going to happen, on who's going to play and everything. So this is a tough one to pick not knowing, but I, I really think the Blackhawks do have a really solid chance to kind of pull off an upset in this one. And I'll I'll shoot for about I'll, – I'll give the Blackhawks around a 30 – I'll go, I'll go about 40% chance to pull this off because I really think even though I understand what Edmonton has in um, – and what they have with the two potential MVP candidates, and I understand that. But if you break down to what happened in the regular season, I really think the Blackhawks matched up well. Chicago won the season series 2-1, to 10-9, and uh, total goals scored. Uh, and when it comes to playoffs, Edmonton is just kind of get going because a lot of their guys are younger. So I think experience does play a huge role in this, obviously with the Blackhawks. Uh, being there plenty of times in the past and having Patrick Kane like, kind of lead everything still. And um, I really think that will go a long way. I think the Blackhawks will try, try to uh, look to take advantage of kind of some holes in Edmonton when they kind of try to get back to going with such a younger group. I think that bodes well for Chicago, kind of having that experience, and especially kind of in, in a restart here uh, with having some older guys as well, kind of giving them rest, kind of getting their legs back underneath them. And, I would not be surprised to see Chicago hang around here and at least make it uh, and give them a fifth game at least. Gotcha. See, uh, I see that point. I would agree with it more if they didn't have a brand spanking new head coach um, because you don't have the experience running camps much in general yet, let alone in such an mm -hmm. odd time like this. Um, so you're going to have to have the player's experience kind of take over there even kind of more so than the coach. So, which I think Kane and Taze for sure have the leadership abilities to do so. It's just their defense is pretty piss poor 
at this point with Seabrook at the end of very, very twilight of his career that's trying to play, too. The key word is trying to play. That's not even sure, certain yet he's going to be. And then Keith is not anything close to what Duncan Keith used to be. Um, so I just think Corey Crawford has – if they, they have a better chance with Crawford, maybe I would ra- – I would raise my uh, percent. I have mine at five uh, percent, honestly, only with them getting upset. If because if Corey Crawford's not playing, I don't think that defense is helping Delia or Malcolm Subban. Um, well, this is of Corey's- course assuming this is assuming it, like Crawford can get out there and play, and I, I really think because again, and the way the other thing I break this down is I kind of see what they did throughout the season. And first, you mentioned the coach, and he was able to pick up on a lot of things throughout the season, and now this layoff. He's able to get whatever what has it been like three months now, yeah, if not four that. months that he's ha- he's been able to, to follow through and make an adjustments. I know I'm crossing over sports here, but look at the Sixers. Brett Brown like went and now he's seeing what he can do different with Simmons, and they're going to try to kind of change their adjustments there. So I think, and I know that goes for both coaches; they can make those adjustments. But that goes here with Chicago as well. I think a new coach kind of can bode well for making those adjustments a little easier because he's not he doesn't have that kind of relationship tied to to owe it to these guys to kind of stick to with the, the system they're kind of used to. So he's able to make those adjustments. And same thing, again, Chicago won the season series to this point. And then even if you break down the way it is, they're only five wins behind Edmonton. And the Central Division's a lot tougher than that Pacific Division. I mean, they're mixed in with a lot of those teams. I mean, you see the first two having plus 90 points and 42 wins in the Blues and Avalanche. So you're playing those guys a lot more. So to be only five wins behind, I really don't think they're that much behind Edmonton. Yeah. I, I would agree in the overall team principle. I just think in the playoffs, the fact of how slow your damn defense is, that's really going to hurt you. And I think they figured a way around that. I'm not gonna, I'm not so sure they're going to be able to figure a way around that in playoff hockey. That's the big question mark that strikes me with the Blackhawks. If it wasn't, if they added one more defenseman or had one more defenseman still, then I would be more confident that they had a chance to upset them or if Brett Seabrook still played more like a lesser version of himself not just like an average defenseman at this point of his career so that's why I put them there if any if either of those two leaders on defense still played pretty good I would have had them a lot higher that's what hurts them because Keith and but not Keith, uh, Taze and Kane still play amazing. Taze is aging like a fine wine, it seems, with that contract. He went, he had that one down year, and then all of a sudden he's like, yeah, you know what, screw this. Uh, you thought I was going to start struggling now? Yeah, all of you were wrong. Um, so then he decided to come back and do great, and I think they're, they're still a two-headed monster. It's just a completely different two-headed monster than the way that, Edmonton's is that's like playmaking combined with scoring where Taze is obviously more of a great defender playmaker than he is a scorer he can score if he feels like it when he wants to shoot but he's more of a playmaker and defender so that's an interesting matchup between those four players I just question the defense of Chicago that's all I think Andrew brings up a good point in their regular season uh I I didn't uh, even think of taking a look at when they played was it pre Yamamoto or post Yamamoto? This team was totally different as Yamamoto came in the mix. That's a good point. Um, so it, that would be interesting to see that. My thing is over a five game series, it's my. I, I agree. Also, the defense. Defense. I'm not really a big uh, fan of. Wasn't even in the beginning of the year. Mm-hmm. Although I think they did fairly well considering. They're on paper defense. They're, played, <laughs> yeah, they're, they're on point. paper defense played a lot better than I expected them to do. Uh, Slater Cuckoo in your top four just doesn't give me warm and fuzzies. And uh, the uh, as far as center, but my biggest thing for this matchup is having um, Kirby Doc, who's still young. He could do some special things. Though. I love point. that kid. Yeah. Um, but. You mentioned Stahl and uh, or Strom, I mean, Dylan Strom. And I, I just think his speed is going to be really difficult for him over a five game series to not be exposed against Dreisaitl and uh, McDavid. Um, if it's a one game series, I, I, I'm with you. You know, I could see Chicago definitely doing it here because you've got these great leaders like Kane and Taves and. 
you know, they can do anything in a one game series, but over a five gamer, I just, I can't give Chicago the nod here. Although I, I re- Andrew brought up a really good point that I hadn't even really considered. Yeah. I will throw out, uh, since you came to the defense, I agree with that too. A lot of people knocked him at only the age of 19, which I also would never knock a player at only the age of 19. I think that's just like <laughs> sacrilegious to a sport to knock somebody. If they stink at 19, they came up at 19. <laughs> so Give them, an, give them another year or so to see if they get going. They came up at when most of people are still in college and still doing stupid stuff with their life and not focusing on the important thing. So, like Alan uh, Wolfrich, do you mean? Yeah, like, yeah, exactly. He did great. Much. At 19 years old, he was fantastic. Yeah. Um, but Doc, um, he only played on a line as eventually when Kubelik got put on his line. Kajul is a decent bottom six guy, but he's not going to help you as a youngster in terms of getting you in there and producing points right away and being able to have a guy in your line that helps you do that. The only guy like that is Kubelik, but Kubelik's also a young kid that's in his first season. He, he, he was on a line that really didn't allow him to explode as much as his talent would have allowed him on a different team, per se, uh, that would have had more guys around him. I think that's honestly all it is. I think he's still going to be a hell of a player. I also think Dylan Strom is still going to be a hell of a player. And with a coach like Carlton and a new system, a young coach, I think that is going to help him. But like you said, skating, I think it'll get better as time and time goes on. I don't know how much better it's got in the last three months. So unless if he really worked on that, and that's what maybe we'll see something different in the postseason. But yeah, I agree with you. He's somebody that probably has a chance until he really hones in that part of his game. Uh, like other players have done, especially locally. Scott mm-hmm. Lawton really focused on that one year and made it a lot better. That's really going to make him go to the next level. But we can now move into our 6 and 11 matchup. Both of these matchups involve former people with associations to the Flyers. We have the Predators and the Coyotes, who were, of course, coached by Rick Tockett, who has an association with the Flyers. Good old Ricky. Um, so what's the percentage chance? I'll let Andrew start with this one. You give good old Ricky's team to beat uh, the Predators. I'm going to go with, I'll give a 20, I'll give a 20% chance to beat the Predators. I, I really like uh, Nashville's team. I think, again, I think the Coyotes, tremendous improvement from what they, they did in, in the uh, previous past, and they're still kind of that upcoming team. I don't think they're ready for a big uh, for a big time playoff series like this against uh, Nashville, who's been really, really good these past few years. And they kind of, Nashville kind of dropped off a little bit this year, but I think overall they're still that solid, quick team and everything. And I think uh, this layoff, it, it kind of helps a team like Nashville in this sense because they were able to kind of regroup a little bit and ho- and they hope to get back to where they were the, these past seasons. And I just, I don't think the Coyotes match up very well. So I'll give them a, a 20% chance. I went five above you. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 uh, I went 25 because I really like Arizona. The problem with Arizona is I think if Nashville's defense steps up on paper, they have a more name brand Defense that has more experience and has done it longer, and they have Dante Fabro, who's disgusting as a youngster. Um, I think that's going to help them, especially if playoff Pekka um, shows up at his best, which is the biggest key, but it could also not be the biggest key because of how well UC Soros played. So I think they have a good issue there, Um, just like the Rangers have a good issue. Their young goaltender... And I'm not comparing UC Soros to Shesterkin. He's not at that level. But their young goaltender stepped up, and now they have to make a decision. Are we going with the guy that has a track record but struggled this year, or are we going to go with the guy that stepped up but doesn't have as much of the track record? I personally believe first game they'll probably go with Pekka, and if he struggles, then they'll have Soros to fall back on because Pekka also, as we know, can move the puck well. And is a guy, I mean, he scored a damn goal this year, finally. I mean, you knew that could happen eventually in his career with the way he would always try to shoot it down. Um, But he's a guy, I think he's helpful to have back there for that reason, too. You can take pressure off your defenseman. Ekholm struggled a bit this year. So some of the guys that did struggle a bit this year, taking pressure off them is very beneficial. And I think he's going to step up. That's the reason I think 
the Predators are going to end up beating the Coyotes. I think that's going to go five, though. But I think the reason they're going to beat them is because Peck is going to step up in the end because of also I think Nashville's defense is going to play its best with John Hines being able to come in and finally have his own camp and be able to kind of do his own thing here and not have a combination of a hybrid, a lavvy system with his system. Well, I'm probably closer to our good friend and uh, legend, Jamie Basco on this one. Um, I'm giving Arizona 55% chance to win. I'm uh, going to give them an edge and it's tough because on paper, Nashville should win this for sure. They've got way more offensive players. I mean, they've got Roman Josie who could be winning the Norris. Norris, yeah. Ryan Ellis, uh, Matthias Ekholm. Can we even call him underrated now? He's been calling underrated so much that it's almost not right to call him underrated anymore. No, Ekholm's not underrated. He just struggled a bit this year compared to his uh, career numbers. But And I, I think the reason why that is Dante Fabro, although he's going to be a good defenseman, I, I don't think he's still – like uh, he he upticked as much as they thought he would this year, and um, they had Corbinian Holzer and Yannick Weber, and that's mm-hmm. what I'm a little bit worried about. Their bottom six defense was not very good this year. I do think you're right that they're going to start Pekka Rene. I don't think that's the right thing to do. I think Juicy Saros should be the one that they start. Um, because they're starting Pekka Rene, I'm going to give Arizona an edge here simply because of the way they play. They play a playoff style, and I just have a funny feeling. It, this is more than gut than anything. Nobody knows how to start a season basically as cold as cold as a lot of these guys are going to be better than Phil Kessel. And the reason why is because he starts every season that cold. Phil Kessel doesn't do anything all summer long and then plays hockey. I just have a feeling this guy's going to score some goals in this series, and he's going to be the difference maker. I think it's going to go five, but it, either team winning would not surprise me at all. I'm just, if I got a pick, I'm going to say Arizona. Um, I also don't know if it's the best thing for Arizona to do, honestly. It'd almost be better to take the 12% shot at Lafreniere in the situation and cap situation that they're in, and organizationally speaking. Um, I think they do have a very underrated defense, uh, Arizona uh, as well. And, of course, I mean, we can't talk about Arizona without talking about Darcy Kemper, who is just, you know, you being a goaltender guy. Yeah, hold up. Wait a minute. Let me see if I can spin this. (laughs) There's a picture of him. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, You can't talk. Like, Darcy Kemper could win this by himself. I mean, he's shown it over and over again, right? So, yeah, no, uh, yeah, he he he's a guy that the question is coming back from a big injury. He's coming back from uh, and stepping right into these huge, meaningful games is not the easiest task at hand. But if anyone can do it, it's someone that's up to his skill level, worked his ass off to get to where he's at now, from where he was at with the Wild, and now where he's at now. But I'm also surprised you didn't mention, uh, I know how much you love Tenorti and you didn't bring him up about how well he played in Nashville's uh, defense. Sorry. Yeah, I mentioned it, and then I said something else, and I forgot. Tenorti did. I, I'm really love Tenorti. I'm very happy for him to come up and do what he's did in his career. It's been fantastic. So, yes, absolutely. Yeah, I was just surprised you didn't mention him because I know how much you like him. But uh, – We'll move on to our next one now, which is another 6v11, which again has a Flyers connection with the Hurricanes coach and good old Rod Brindamore with the Hurricanes that have the greatest celebrations of dunking on themselves after games, bowling over their entire teammates, uh, whatever they so choose to do. And also don't have a lot of injuries somehow. So, you know, they know how to really take care of each other doing all that. And then against the Rangers, who have really done well since Dave Quinn's take to, taken over, excuse me, I must say. So I don't know where you guys have this series. I'll let Pirlo start with this one in this six versus 11 matchup. Well, I mean, um, 
I'm giving, I'll just say it straight out. I'm giving Carolina 40. I got Rangers 60 on this one. Uh, and that's hard to say because you know me. I love Brindy. And uh, it's just the goaltending. That's it. You switch goaltenders, mm-hmm. you push just Sturkin in Carolina, and I'm taking Carolina. I, I just, I can't get that kid out of my head. I just love the way he played. Um, I don't think it's going to change. I do think they're going to play him. If they do something crazy and put Lundqvist in, my 60s not going to look so good. I'm not going to mm-hmm. feel so good about it. But uh, with Shesterkin in there, um, you mentioned something very good there about their uh, offensive depth. When you look at guys, uh, I mean, overall through the whole season, Philip Heidel didn't step it up early enough. Mm-hmm. Uh, Capo Cackle maybe didn't perform offensively, although he's still a young kid, right? But yes. maybe they thought they were going to get a little more out of him. Brett Howden, they thought they were going to get a little more of. But I saw a lot of that, especially in a lot. Did you know that Zibanejad got 22 goals in 23 games or something like that? <laughs> yeah, he was ridiculous. Really. Like, unbelievable. <laughs> and Artemi Panarin and all of that. We can go down. I mean, the Carolinas got Svechnikov. Uh, wow, what a fantastic. Aho, uh, Nietzsche, uh, Niederreiter. I mean, they've got a lot of offensive depth there as well. Defense, I give to Carolina. I mean, definitely yeah. absolutely no doubt about it if they can get the goaltending i could definitely see this winning it wouldn't surprise me but if you're asking me for a percentage i'm giving the rangers 60 percent i their defense is a little young though so you know you're talking about d'angelo ryan lindgren adam fox how are these guys going to perform in the playoffs it is a bit of a question mark there. And um, if Shesterkin isn't at the top of his game like he was, now I'm swinging a little more over to Carolina. I love Brindy's system, and I love the mo- He's one of the best motivators you can find. He was when he was a player, and it doesn't appear to be changing as a coach. So I, it's, it's, it really comes down to I just can't get Shesterkin out of my head, honestly. <laughs> yeah, I know they looked at it on NHL – um, yesterday when I was watching a video and they said no matter what way uh, they go people think this is going to be a tight series because yeah Lundqvist struggle but you're in the postseason if you put him in you know the team's going to play well well you would think so um in the postseason coming off a of wall is going to play well in front of their legendary goaltender regardless to play well in front of the rook because they've done it all year but I think Coming back from that lull, there's a higher chance they might go with Lundqvist. I think if this was rolling pretty and we never had a stoppage, then they would have went with the hot hand. But now it's like all cards are kind of on the table with like it almost being like Jamie Bascal uh, said, um, a restart to a season, like almost like a fresh start almost because of how long we had off. So that's what's going to be uh, interesting, but I'll let Andrew give uh, his percentage first before I say mine. Yeah, actually, I like the Rangers better in this series than, than the uh, Hurricanes as well. I'm going to go. I was 65 percent with the Rangers. I think uh, the what they they kind of got off to a really slow start and kind of had to turn it on in, in the second half of the season, really. And uh, what they were able to do to kind of climb up the standings, even to get into this position uh, to where they are now. Uh, really puts them in a good spot here. And I think uh, with the layoff there, it kind of helps them as well. And, I mean, uh, Panarin, like Panarin, but just a tremendous player, MVP candidate, really better than anyone on the Hurricanes. I think the best player on this ice is going to go to the Rangers in this one. And I think overall, and they they had uh, the Hurricanes number this year. Uh, the Rangers went 4-0 and against Carolina this season, 17-9 to total score. So I think overall you see it there in the season, uh, season games right there that – uh, Rangers ma- just match up really well with Carolina, and I think you're not going to see anything different here in the playoffs. Again, an MVP candidate, uh, kind of the better player on ice usually helps the, the team win in a series. So I'm, I'm going to go with the Rangers on this one, uh, 65%. Your reasoning is the reason why, again, I doubted uh, – I, I loved him as soon as he came in, but because of his team, I doubted him at times last year, and whenever I bet against him, I lost. So I uh, <laughs> decided to stop doubting Rod Brindamore. So um, I went with 40% because I think the Hurricanes have a chance of winning. I think 
the Rangers have a good chance of winning. So that's kind of I, I went with that high of a number because I think Svechnikov, you never know with him. Like Jamie said, like I brought up, you're coming into almost a new fresh season. So a guy with his talent almost coming off of a new fresh off season too, that might almost be like his next season coming into the league where then you could just take off like a firecracker and almost be right there with Panarin matching him in the uh, series with the talent level uh, he's at. It's just you never know. There's just so much ifs with this scenario because everyone's coming back fresh and you don't know who's going to get their legs right away and who's not. That's the that's so much. You don't have those questions in normalcy. I think we also have to mention Dougie Hamilton will be back too. And that is really like they, they went downhill quite a bit after Dougie Hamilton. Broke yeah, his leg there. Pesce won't be though. Uh, he won't be back? Brett, Dougie Hamilton will. Brett Pesce was put on the roster, but from what I read, they oh, said Pesce he's not to play. Pesce won't be yeah. back. Pesce won't be back yet. No. But that, but that kind of hurts a little bit because he's one of your Gardner struggled a bit. So with the fact that Flurry played well, you got Hamilton back. You had Shea. You had Slavin. There's a chance Jake Gardner might have not even played if if uh, Pesce was able to play because of how much he struggled. You have Vadnin and Van Riemsdyk too. There's a good chance you're odd man out. It might still be Jake Gardner, but it would have definitely probably been Jake Gardner with how he played this year, uh, because most people forgot that they got Sammy Vodnin too. So uh, yeah. that that helps a lot as well, in my opinion, especially the fact that they didn't know this was going to happen, but they aren't going to have Pesce uh, back um, for even this extended clip. He's still not going to be back. So that's very beneficial to me. I think that move in itself also helps me to give them the better chance to win the series because if they lost Pesce and then had to rely more on Gardner, who's more offensively touted in a struggling season too, I wouldn't have liked that as much. But the fact that they have someone like Vadden in TVR, JVR's brother is actually a very underrated solid uh, defenseman that kind of usually just takes what's given to him and doesn't do anything stupid really. So um, that's, uh, that's why I have that where I have that. But we can move in now to our seven versus ten matchups. And I'll go first to the Canucks versus Wild. I think this is a very interesting matchup. We have the goalie Jacob Markstrom coming into his contract. So you know he's going to be playing for, like I said in the last video, money, 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 money. Like Mr. Krabs used to say in uh, Spongebob. Um, and then we have Devin Dubnik, who's coming off of a down year. Might get the nod for experience. Um, and then you also have Alex Stalock, who played very well when he got put in and is a very, very good, potentially um, top three in the league in terms of puck moving goaltenders. So if you want to go with the hot hand, that really helps your defense, like I said before, in terms of taking pressure off of your defense in Minnesota as well if they did go with Staylock because he knows how to move the puck around the boards, get it up to the appropriate person. And I do like that for them if they decide to go with him since Dubnik was struggling. Now, I do love Devin Dubnik as a goalie, though. So if they decide to go with him and he plays as well as he could, uh, then they're still potentially in a good spot. But it depends. I want to see where uh, your guys' percentage is with this. I'm going to surprise, uh, probably. All right. Well, I'll let you go first, then, since you sorry, said it. Yeah, sorry. I, I'm going to surprise. I, I, I'm, I got Minnesota winning this series, and I know I'm one of the few people that do. Um, and to tell you the honest truth, I could go through the X's and O's, and I'm usually an X's and O's guy. Not very often. I just go straight on gut. But Dean Evison, the way – there's times when you just see a team work – in a situation with a coach and Everson came in and this team was magic going into the break. And I don't think that magic's going to change. He had everything working in the same, everybody working in the, and, and, and believing in themselves in such a way, uh, not to mention there's other reasons that are X's and O's that I am taking this as well. Eric Stahl, to me, is one of the most underrated centers of all time. And um, in a 82-game schedule at his age of 35, he's not a number one center. But for five games, he is. And if you give him five games with fresh legs, 
I I really like the way he's going to match up to guy to a guy like Peterson. His defensive game is one of the most underrated defensive centers in the game that ha- of the last ten years. Um, not to not to mention, you also have Miku Koivu at 38 years old with fresh legs, who's mm-hmm. also one of the best two way centers yeah. of the last little while. And um, without going w- going into all of that, I mean, going into Vancouver, I can give you can give me I can give myself all the reason to pick Vancouver. I mean, <laughs> you got <laughs> Peterson, that Quinn kid. I I want to watch this series just to watch that kid play. I just love him. Markstrom, like you just mentioned, contract year, he could steal it all um, and all of that. But I am taking Minnesota, and I'm giving Minnesota 60% chance to win this, and I'm saying it's mostly on gut, and I uh, most of the arguments against me, I can't argue with. <laughs> well, so. I had, I had um, along with, uh, I believe, Jamie, I'm trying to see... Um, if he also had for the Canucks and uh, Wild. Yeah, we both had 50, uh, 50, 50 even on that. So I might, I'm starting to lean a little bit here. So I'll listen to Andrew's side and see what happens. Uh, so Andrew, go for it. See if you can uh, sway or not sway here. I think uh, these two teams are pretty close to even. I think uh, it's, Tough to really give one or the other the advantage. I'll give the Wild a slight, slight advantage on this one. I'll go fifty. I'll go fifty-one forty-nine Wild. I really think it's that close, but um, I, I think for the same reasons. I mean, Eric Stahl, a tremendous center, he'll be there. Uh, I think uh, Zach Reese, he'll be a tremendous player for the Wild there as well. Uh, and again, I think after the trade deadline, the Wild were one of the hottest teams in the league. So I think those trades they made really go bode well for them to continue that success. Is people now forget yeah, for the trades they made. I don't think people remember they have Golchenyuk on their team. He didn't play well this year, but he's a skilled player. Imagine if he gets go. Yeah, they brought in him. They brought in Zucker and uh, Sealer there from uh, midseason trades. And I think they really started to click after they kind of got going a few games after the trade deadline. So, yeah, the layoff here these last few months might stop them with that momentum but it kind of gives them also room to grow chemistry and i'm sure i mean i don't know what they were doing behind scenes but obviously you can't practice but i'm sure they were staying in touch and doing other stuff to build their chemistry with each other that's going to go a long way and honestly what with again with the way they kind of performed after the trade deadline adding these guys and the success they found with them in the lineup i really think that helped them and i really think it's going to go a long way in this series and uh, again, I think it's pretty close, but I think Wild do have a slight edge there from those acquisitions. Yeah, I also think uh, a big thing is when you decide to make your coach go from interim to definite makes a big change in your locker room. When your locker room knows we have this guy ride or die with us going into next year and not just for potentially the next five games, um that that means a lot, I think, to guys, especially when, like Pirlo said, you saw an adjustment with that team. You saw them get going when Everson came in. There's a reason why he got rewarded the way he did. So I I had it at 50-50. I, I honestly knocked the wild up to 55. So I put it, I'll give the wild a 55% uh, chance because of just how good I think the big thing I said and you made the point with a new coach, uh, he's going to get to come in, Andrew, he's going to get to come into his camp and say, okay, this is kind of what we did that was mixed with the old system. Let's get rid of this stuff that kind of screwed us a bit and fine-tune it and really hone in what I think we need to do to really get to where we need to be. So I think that also gives the Wild a best chance, also because I believe in both of their goalies. I think Dubnik can step back up. And Alex Daylock, like I just said, helps the defense immensely because he's one of the best puck moving goalies in the league. So, yeah, I want to Staylock. Um, I've always been waiting for that guy. He's always had everything. It's just putting it all together, and he seems like one of those guys that like will be one of those late thirty year old players that from the last five or six years of his career will be a number one goaltender, and people will like, where did he come from? But for like you and I'm sure you guys have been, especially a goaltender fan like you, Joe, 
he, you watched him. I watched him the whole right. Was he at LA? Where did he start at? But I think I, it was LA. Yeah, I'm trying yeah, to think. And I was always like, Jesus guy, what this something? He's he, he's going to make it. It's just it's taken a long time, and, and it, it feels like he's made it. I think they may start him. Just because I think that, so too. just yeah, because yeah. they were doing so well with them before, right? No, I agree with that. I think that would be potentially the wise decision. He played here. Yeah, I brought up in twenty games. He was eleven and four, the two six seven and a nine ten. So he played pretty well. But also, like I said, on top of those stats, he has a dimension of being able to take pressure off of your defense better than Devin Dubnik can in terms of moving the puck. Doobie can get a little. He can be good at that some games, and then in other games, it's like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. And then, so... It's not uh, his best. Yeah, it's, <laughs> not, it's, not, necessar- it's not necessarily his best uh, trait, so... He was an oiler, and, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure Connor McDavid and uh, some other guys in the Oilers were thinking that, looking at him sometimes, like, oh, sweet Jesus, oh, sweet Jesus, oh, well, sweet McDavid Jesus. David wasn't there. At the oh, yeah, you're right. Oh, yeah, you're right. That was, that was way back. That was way back. Yeah. That was that was way. Who would have been? Is anybody even on the team that would have been on with Dubna? Uh, <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah, I don't yeah. think so. Oh, yeah, maybe, that's a wild uh, God, good question. Clef bomb me. <laughs> yeah, uh, or New, was New, Nuge wasn't on the team with maybe him? Maybe Nuge for a little bit. Yeah. I don't think so because then he went to Arizona and Burke got a hold of him and changed a few things and made him into what he is today. But yeah. So. uh we're moving anyway. Uh, we'll move into the seven and ten next matchup now, which is another division foe of the Flyers, the Islanders against the Panthers. So I'll let Andrew start with this one. What do you give the struggling Sergei Bobrovsky esque uh, Panthers a chance to beat the Islanders? I think it's just like the last one. I think this is going to be a pretty close series. I, I mean, he, like you mentioned, uh, Bobrovsky really struggled this season, but, I mean, that's really not who he is. Um, he had a career uh, goals against two, I think it's a little over 2.5, uh, and compared to what he's done this year is a 3.23, so it's definitely an odd spot for him. I think the him going to a new team, kind of figuring out the defense, kind of had a, had us play into it. Uh, again, I think that this kind of layoff could help him, and, the way the Islanders really, really struggled at the end of the uh, end of the season before that suspension or before the season got uh, suspended, I, I don't think. I mean, with all the things that were kind of going downward spiral, that, that's a lot to kind of make up. Obviously, you can still make it up, but we'll see. I'm gonna give the Panthers a uh, a slight edge here. I'll go 55-45 uh, on the uh, Panther side. Okay. Cool. Uh, I think uh, what you said is uh, spot on about the Islanders did struggle in the end. It's just I think the layoff, they might be one of the teams that benefited from the most because you have Barry Trotz. Barry Trotz tends to be a coach that can kind of um, get everybody where he wants them to be, especially if you have time to adjust when you were struggling and the fact that you had three freaking months um, and then you had people coming back of zoom calls and then you had uh, people coming back to camp. So or phone chats that you have with whatever, if you made yourself available like that. Um, so I think that's helpful for them because of Bob's struggles and just Quinville kind of hinted it at it at his interview. And this kind of made me keep their percentage so low they got all their goal scoring from mostly unexpected guys. Like he said, Ajari and uh, Khan Lee really stepped up for us. We need all of our guys like Barky and everybody, Huberto, really to be the dominators they can be. And if, they, if they're not that, I don't think Florida, with the way Bob struggled this year with that defense, I think that might more be something that takes after this year to figure out because that just seemed like, they were not in unison much at all this year. Um, but if they figure it out by the playoffs, that'll be huge because Chris Dreiger played great in the regular season. I don't know if he's going to be able to step up for you in the postseason if Bobrovsky struggles. So I um, I think I put that percentage a little low, so I'll move it up, but I only gave the – I'll give them a 10% chance. Wow. I, I just think – 
I think the way these two teams are kind of like they're both pretty even, and I think you saw that in the regular season. And the way like the Islanders didn't just like spy out like they they were a mess on all standpoints. From they would they would score some games, then they give up a ton of goals, then they'd score nothing uh, and give up nothing as well. And I felt like their mess was a little bigger. And the fact that the Panthers were, as you mentioned, able to have other guys step up, I'd expect the better the better players as they were expecting to score. I expect that to change when it comes playoff time and you have that those two groups kind of mesh together and, and it really bode well for them. That, and again, the way Bobrovsky just played this year, like that's not like him at all. And I don't see why that would continue to be a struggle of his. I'd expect him to get back to normal after such a long layoff. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. What do you think, Pirlo? Well, you know, I, mean, I I'm kind of an energy guy uh, when it comes to, especially when it comes to playoffs. And, uh, but, well, first of all, let's start off with the Bobrovsky thing. Uh, Bobrovsky in Columbus, he, 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 it seems quite obvious that a lot of goaltenders benefit from Tortorella's system uh, uh, quite a bit. And I think they, over, they possibly overpaid a guy that was getting a huge benefit from his system. Also, at the end of, during that last two seasons, Bobrovsky was showing a pension for being kind of a prima donna. And uh, it seems like in Florida, he's been blaming a lot of his defense and individual people and stuff like that. Uh, that is a red flag and very concerning for me about the future of him in, in, uh, as, a, as a NHL. I think he needs to get his head straightened out somehow in a lot of ways. Could be wrong there. But um, the other thing about Florida I find very difficult is the trading of Trocheck. The trading of Trocek was an obvious move to say that we are not going to spend the money, right? And mm -hmm. so you've got Eric Halla that comes in, who is a gamer, you know, third, fourth line guy, energy guy, whatever the case may be, but he's not what Trocek is supposed to be. He's not your second line center. There's been murmurs about ownership saying that they're going to, to start taking down the salaries. This is showing signs of, maybe Florida not doing well as an organization and all of this drama going into a playoff series. You've got Mike Hoffman, who's likely not going to come back. Evgeny Dadunov, who's likely not going to be able to come back. They're not going to sign all of this stuff. Plus the Bobrovsky situation going into a play in series, I think is going to get into people's heads more than people think. And uh, that being with that in mind, you, you mentioned Barry Trotz, who is one of the best coaches this, of this generation, and uh, the kind what he can do with a, with a team. Um, the New York Islanders were not doing well at the end of the season. I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that I said before the season started, if the Islanders made the playoffs, Trot should get coach of the year. Now, I did not know that Tortorella was going to do what he did with the Columbus Blue Jackets. Yeah. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I mean, that's insane. But um, because that were, that team is doesn't have much depth, and I think they just had a lot of players playing way more minutes than they're mm -hmm. used to and maybe should, and it was wearing at them. Now so what would you a, put? So what would you it. put your uh, percentage at? I just want to because we're hitting uh, the fifty minute mark almost. Are I wanted oh, to geez. move it along. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, <laughs> I'm going to give the Islanders seventy percent to win. Seventy. Got you. Um, and then now we're moving to our eight, nine matchups. You just hinted at the one team, the Tortorella led blue jackets against the host city, Toronto Maple Leafs. Uh, Andrew, I'll let you kick off with this and see if you want to piss off the host city or not, or, uh, <laughs> make them happy. So, uh, wh where are you going here? Just like the last couple, I mean, these are two pretty close matched up teams. Uh, the thing about this one is the Blue Jackets they were a very weird team this year. They got off to a really good start. Then they dealt with a lot of injuries, so they kind of dropped off a little bit, allowed teams to catch up to them. And that kind of put them in this position was the drop off they had. But, I mean, as you guys mentioned, the tremendous coaching there kind of kept them afloat. And I think he should be in consideration for coach of the year, if not win it. However, when it comes down to it, uh, I do think Toronto will, will has a little edge in this one just because of 
I think uh, Matthews will be the best player on the ice. And as I alluded to earlier, I think the team with the best player will ultimately usually win the series. So in a five-game series, I think Matthews and, and Tavares will really bode well for this uh, Maple Leafs team. And I think that that will kind of carry them a little bit in this series. And I, even though, I mean, obviously this layoff should help the Blue Jackets get closer to, to healthy. I mean, you still got to worry about some of that and see how slow they kind of get off. And I think that that slow start could really hurt them this one. So uh, I'll give, I'll give the blue jackets, I'll, I'll give them a, a 40% chance. 40% chance. Gotcha. That's still a pretty decent chance of, uh, yeah, I, I think it'll be winning. a pretty good yeah. series. I just feel uh, like it's, uh, it's going to go uh, the host uh, way. Gotcha. I, uh, I think I, um, I gave, no, I gave them a 30 and that's because of eh, Freddie. Uh, I think he's a very underrated goaltender, uh, Anderson, their netminder in uh, Toronto. And I think he's really going to step up in this pro season. I think Merz Lincolns is a great goalie, and I think Corby's a good goalie. Problem is they just got into the league recently. They're basically uh, puppies in the league. So I think Freddie Anderson will um, take the cake there if it comes down to goaltending. Now, if it comes down to defense – uh, I'm not so sure that the Leafs defense will take the cake over the Blue Jackets. Well, no, not that I'm not sure they won't. Uh, but I uh, I uh, think the goaltending will, and that's what will balance it out because I think Columbus's goaltending will play well. It's just you're more prone to let in a soft goal as an inexperienced goaltender than as a guy that's been there, done that. Sometimes that just happens, and you're not going to blame the guy. I never blame Michael. I, I don't blame Michael Layden to this day. But uh, it is what it is. Uh, I think Toronto got a little unlucky with their matchup in the first round here. Um, Columbus's game is exactly what they don't want to see. Uh, Toronto's too soft. Uh, their defense is deplorable as far as I'm concerned, uh, as far as their defenseman is concerned. Offensively, sure, Matthews can take on a series and win it by himself. I haven't seen a shot like that in too many players. So could but Mitch. I- both of them combined could kind of yeah. take them. But I just think that, first of all, Tortorella's burnt me so many times. He's my favorite coach. <laughs> he's my favorite coach He's ever. your Rod Brindamore. And I still underrate him, even though he's my favorite coach ever. So I'm taking Columbus. I'm not going to do that. And I think it's going to be handily, actually. I think Toronto's going to be frustrated with Columbus, and I'm giving Columbus 70% chance of winning this, which I know is pretty surprising. But, yeah. Um, no, I can see that because of torch in the day. I just feel like I think Freddie Anderson, he didn't play completely up to his stats. Now, of, of course, a lot of that had to do with the fact that their defense played soft. Um, so if their defense that does have some guys that are not small, um, don't play soft and play a little bit more to the size of themselves that, and don't just decide to score and actually do a little bit better on the bruising defensive end at defending their own puck at stay at home, then that'll help out. And maybe Keith uh, having this extended uh, off time and having this post, not this postseason, this training camp before the postseason, excuse me, maybe that'll really help Sheldon Keith. But uh, I think uh, that I think that's what will mainly help him. But I think the main reason they're going to win is because Anderson's going to step up and have a very good – low twos uh, at most goals against average in this uh, series um, with a very high 9.15 to 9.20-something state percentage. I think he's probably going to go off in this series and be the reason Toronto wins. But we'll move into our final series, which is the battle of two Canadian teams in the Winnipeg Jets, who have a potential Vezina Trophy candidate on their hands. And then the Calgary Flames. So, Pirlo, I'll let you start with this one. Who do you got in the Jets versus Flames? Again, I'm an energy guy as well in a lot of cases, and I don't like Calgary's energy going in. Um, I don't think Goudreau is very happy being there from what I've read. Uh, now I think he's there's a very good chance he's traded in the offseason. Um Defense-wise, I mean, I love Giordano. I love their defense. Definitely Calgary's – I'll take Calgary's defense over Winnipeg's on paper any day. 
I'll take Winnipeg's depth on offense over Calgary's any day. Um, yeah. And I'll take Hullabuck over Rinich any day. So also, I just Lucic in that lineup is such an anchor. My gosh, it's just terrible. Every lineup that he goes up against, if he's in the roster, is going to be able to expose that. Uh, I think Winnipeg wins, and I think fairly handily, I'm going to give them 70% to win. And I, I raised that up. I actually was closer to 50-50 for a while, but the more I think about it, the more I like Winnipeg. That's what I was close to, 50-50, but I like the Flames' defense. I do agree, energy does have a case thing, but I think this three months off, they realize they have the better team on paper. If they actually get their heads on right, they're going to know they have a good chance to win this thing. Um, So I think that might benefit them because the Jets, just like this season, are going to need Hellbuck to step up again because once you go below Morrissey and Pionk, you're – and – uh. Ben Chirot, who's there now, um, your defense isn't the most deep appealing thing. So, but Andrew, uh, what, what do you think there? Uh, in this series, I really liked uh, Winnipeg in this series just because, uh, as I alluded to earlier, um, with Gruder struggling, and I think obviously he had the trade rumors last season. I forgot about that whole offseason mess, and now he's obviously unhappy. He's had the probably the worst season statistically for himself uh, throughout his uh, young career so far and uh, it, it really showed I mean he only has 58 points up, up until that uh, uh, layoff there and I really like what uh, Kyle Connor's done with Winnipeg uh, leading there on the on the left wing side and uh, just being a tremendous player for him I feel like he's undervalued not really mentioned a lot you don't hear his name too often I feel like he's really stepped up and I feel like the Winnipeg's their depth and their their uh their ability to kind of share the puck rather than rely on one guy, and this is a lot better than other teams. So I really like Winnipeg's chances here. And uh, but as far as as far as that, I'll go with uh, in terms of the upset. I guess I'll give Calgary probably about a thirty-five percent chance to win this. Okay, so then your Jets would be okay. Yeah. I love Kyle. I like you mentioned Connor. I like his playoff type game he's got a playoff yes. game. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah i just think goudreau uh knowing he's potentially going to get traded he's going to heighten his value also like i told pierlon i tell you this andrew uh when i look at players that are great if you're down here's 58 points in 70 damn games i'll, t- I'll take that that's fine no, that's I-, I agree with that <laughs> but like his down here seems to clearly be kind of because of an issue in there and oh i i, I, I don't see that. Yeah. I don't see that changing because it's not like his contract's up where he has to play well to make that money. Like, his contract is his contract. Like, getting traded doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the way he plays, and it's clearly affecting it. So I don't see that really changing at all because he wants out. So he's no, he doesn't have that same incentive to kind of get to that extra mile as some of the, guy, some of the guys do that are, they have a contract expiring. That's a very good point, but we're coming to the end here, so I'm going to hand it over to you guys if you want to share any links or anything. So, uh, Pierlo, I'll let you go first. I just started back again on BPAL Picks. Uh, I'm a professional capper. That's what I do. I give help people out with betting. And you can go over to BPAL Picks on YouTube or our Patreon and check us out. Uh, we all. I also have my own channel called Perlo's NHL Pearls of Wisdom. Check that out. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Thank you again, guys, for having me. This has been freaking awesome. Love You're it. very welcome. And then, uh, Andrew, go ahead, my friend. I'll go. Uh, obviously, uh, we have this great one at uh, True uh, underscore Philadelphia uh, or underscore Philly Sport. Uh, check out me and Joe at uh, Chasing the Pennant, A N Y P Phillies podcast is the Twitter handle. Uh, another one I do with my brother's Philly underscore sports now, and then my personal Twitter is AJ underscore Santangelo. And another one, uh, Pub Sports Radio. I do a radio show uh, Tuesday nights at 6 Eastern, 5 Central, uh, called A Baseball Show. And then I also write for Pub Sports Radio as well. Yeah, I also write for the Pub Sports Radio, Flyers Nitty Gritty with Jamie Baskell. Do this fine podcast, of course, like Andrew said, the chase and the pennant. And uh, we have True Philadelphian Sportscast also spelled out on Instagram now. So go check that out. We can put videos up there. And then I also have been putting them on my own Instagram. But JJ Borick 26 is my Twitter. This has been True Philadelphian Sportscast, the grittiest take 
upset alert percentage predictions episode. For Pirlo, for Andrew, I am Joe. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Peace out.